Okay, so I'm going to try to keep this brief and then you can have um, plenty of time in the gallery to look round. And I'm, there, there is a book, not strictly speaking a catalogue, but a book. This is actually a very biographical exhibition, so I've tried to tell the story in this book. And I'm going to whiz through the exhibition. I'm going to look at things in the order that you'll find them in the exhibition. Because obviously, if I tried to give you all a tour in the actual gallery, that would be very difficult. Um, so I'll try not to repeat too much of what's in here, but I would encourage you to get hold of a copy of this. Thank you to all of you who've, who've already bought it. Um, but I hope that we'll have copies available in the gallery that you can look at during quiet moments. If we get any quiet moments, of course, um, we'll, we'll try and remember to put one in the tea house as well for you. So, just to explain some background to the whole exhibition and how did I get the idea, it actually dates back to 2001 when I started work on this exhibition. This is something I was thrown into um, even before I came here. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the catalogue if you've not been to the exhibition all those years ago. But we did touch a little bit on the subject of Joseph Wright in Bath in this exhibition on portrait painting in Bath 1720 to 1800. And I was really intrigued to think that Joseph Wright of Derby was in Bath. Um, it seemed like quite a strange juxtaposition of two aspects of British 18th century culture that um, we think of in very different ways. And I wanted to find out more about it. I wanted to know more about um, exactly where he lived, what did he do when he was here, why did he stay such a short time. And most of all, could we get together some pictures to make an exhibition with them? So one of the other things that sort of drove me to work on this was the exhibition in Liverpool in 2007, Joseph Wright of Derby in Liverpool. I thought, well, if you can do an exhibition about his 18 months in Liverpool, he was there for slightly longer than that, on and off. Um, but if, if they can do one about that, then we can do one about Bath. And it was something that we planned a long time ago, before we reopened in 2011. It was something that we knew we wanted to do after reopening. Two organisations that I would like to thank before we go on any further and to help you understand the background to this exhibition and how these things work. This gentleman here, this is Paul Mellon, um, who died in the late 1990s. His foundation in London has been very generous really in funding pretty well all of the research that's ever been done on Joseph Wright, but particularly this exhibition. He was um, an oil magnet in Pittsburgh. He was a great Anglophile. He loved all things English. He had studied at Cambridge. He also studied at Yale. He gave a lot of money to Yale University. Um, he founded the Yale Centre for British Art. And he also founded in London the Paul Mellon Centre, which is a sort of London branch of the Yale Centre for British Art. And they have been extremely generous. They've given us a big grant, which has allowed me the enormous luxury. Um, I'm probably not grateful enough for this, but for, to spend two days a week for 18 months researching this subject in detail. Um, they also paid for most of the expenses for the catalogue, and they've paid for most of the costs behind the study day, which will be happening a month from today on the 24th of February. The other organisation that we couldn't have done this exhibition without is Derby Museum. And Derby Museums are in a very interesting situation at the moment. They've just 
stopped being under local authority control, and they're now um, an independent trust. They've got a new board of trustees. And Joseph Wright is at the heart of Derby Museums. He's at the heart of the cultural life of Derby. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's very, very different from Bath nowadays. Um, whereas Bath, I think, has got too much arts and culture going on. In Derby, there's very, very little. So this gallery is of tremendous importance. This is the Joseph Wright Gallery. They have 34 of his oil paintings. They've got about 300 drawings and bits of correspondence and things as well. So it's a tremendously important collection. Um, there's the Indian Widow which is now here, so they've got a big gap on their walls. They've been very generous in lending to this exhibition, but also in advising us. I've been working closely with this lady, Lucy Bamford, who is sort of my equivalent now. As you can see, she is incredibly strong. She's <laughs> managing to hold up this picture all by her little self. <laughs> OK, so let's look at the pictures in the exhibition. It starts, if any of you have peeked through the doors, you'll have seen that it starts by meeting the man himself. Here he is in a really beautiful self-portrait from Derby. This is done in charcoal and it shows you the sort of level of skill that he had. He was described as a very great and uncommon genius in a peculiar way. So in other words, great, great genius, an uncommon genius, and also a bit quirky and different. Um, his great special, specialism was with light. He was described in the great monograph by Benedict Nicholson as Joseph Wright of Derby, painter of light. And you can see here how he uses charcoal and chalk to bring light out of darkness, to make his own face emerge from the shadows. And in some ways, this is a sort of little art historical trick that he's doing. He wants you to think of something like this. He wants you to think that he's like Rembrandt, and that's why he's wearing that hairy hat <laughs> like Davy Crockett, and um, beautiful um, velvety coat with a fur collar, very much like Rembrandt. So why is he right of Derby? Well. He started calling himself that in Liverpool, and it was to distinguish himself from Richard Wright, who was a Liverpool artist and who specialised in um, marine pictures, ships and boats and things. But he did identify very strongly with Derby. He was born in Derby in the heart of the city. He was raised there. He spent almost all of his life there, and he died there. He was born in 1734, so he's seven years younger than Gainsborough. And his father was quite well off. He was an attorney. He worked very closely with all the, the gentry families in Derby, Derbyshire. The county was sort of dominated by one or two big families, so the Cavendishes, who had all those great houses in Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, the Curzons. And then it was all sort of small gentry families who owned little pockets of land that had been um, sort of cut up during the course of the 16th century. And those sort of families are his father's clients. And they become his clients as well. He shows a great interest, not just in art as a, as a young lad, he loves drawing, but also in how things work, in um, particularly how optical things work. And so his parents sent him as a pupil to Thomas Hudson, first of all in 1751, so when he was 16 he was packed off to London. Thomas Hudson was the leading portrait painter of the time. He also taught Sir Joshua Reynolds, worked very closely with Alan Ramsey. And Wright did not go to him as an apprentice, so he didn't go as a bonded labourer tied in for seven years to learn a trade. He went as a gentleman, a fee-paying pupil, so it was a very different sort of relationship. And then some years later, 
he went back to London and back to Hudson for um, another year's training so that he could really polish his portrait style. And in his early work, you really see the influence of Hudson, particularly in the beautiful drapery painting, which is such a mark of his work. The first really successful portraits that he did, um, he would travel around Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, painting ladies and gentlemen. But it was this group, this was a group of six portraits of the gentleman of the Mark Eaton hunt. And um, this is Harry Peckham. I'm sorry he's so fuzzy, um, but Harry was a famous sportsman. And this is Francis Mundy, who commissioned the whole series. Six portraits, all his mates from the hunt. And Wright exhibited these in the town hall in Derby. So for him, it's like a sort of public debut. And of course, all of these men were local landowners, so they would all have been well recognised by the people in Derby. <clears throat> his second sort of big moment is his debut at the Society of Arts exhibition in London. In 1765, he sends this extraordinary painting, Three Persons Viewing the Gladiator by Candlelight. It's a picture really... Um, it's not a portrait, it's not really a narrative history painting, it's just something that looks back very much to the 17th century, and it's about connoisseurship. It's about the pleasures of the imagination, the pleasures of enjoying art. So there's a piece of sculpture, a piece of drawing there on the easel, and here um, is the pedestal for the sculpture. So. Um, it's about <clears throat> that, that sort of sense of, of sensory enjoyment to be had, crowded round beautiful things. Notice that the, the candle is hidden, so what's lighting up their faces you can't see. This could be him, this could be Joe. This is his great mate, Peter Perez Burdett. And Burdett is somebody he works with very closely and who feeds ideas to him. Burdett's an amateur scientist, and he feeds him ideas to do with science. And it's now in the later 1760s that we get all those astonishing paintings which Wright is so famous for. So all of these sciencey things happened before Bath. So we get, in 1766, the philosopher giving a lecture on the orrery with some children looking at a diagram of the or a model of the solar system. Again, the light source is hidden. And the experiment with the air pump in the National Gallery with the mad scientist suffocating the expensive parrot and the little girls here looking very anxious about their birds. No combination of moonlight and these artificial lights here. Again, your light source is hidden down there somewhere. Something very nasty lurking in that jar. I just want to point out this rather infatuated couple in the corner who they, they're not interested in the suffocating parrot. That's actually Thomas and Mary Coltman, and we'll meet them again later on. Just as an aside, um, people who've written about rights in the past have associated this kind of experiment very much with the birth of the Industrial Revolution and with the Midlands, and in particular with the Lunar Society, which was a group of um, professional men and landowners who um, had a common interest in science and innovation and discovery and philosophy, and they would regularly meet. It wasn't really a formally constituted society, but they would meet regularly to discuss ideas. Wright was not a member, but many of his friends were. And I'm going to be talking in particular about Erasmus Darwin and John Whitehurst, who were both key members of that. But what I'd like to draw to your attention is the fact that this was all going on in Bath as well, perhaps even to a greater extent. There are accounts and advertisements for exactly this kind of lecture frequently in Bath. Travelling scientists 
would come, they would give courses of lectures, both to the sort of idle curious and to people who needed to know about this stuff for the development of their business. So we have an account from as early as 1731 of just such a lecture as this, except that it wasn't a parrot in the bell jar, it was a fish. And um, there was a lady in the audience who was very disturbed and rescued the fish and threw it into the River Avon. So that was in 1731, nearly 40 years before this picture. So Bath was there first. It's a point I'm trying to make. The alchemist, in search of the philosopher's stone, discovers phosphorus and prays for the successful conclusion of his operation, as was the custom of the ancient chemical astrologers. That's the title of that picture. <laughs> um, it just about fitted into the catalogue for the 1771 Society of Artists <coughs> exhibition. This is in our exhibition, and the reason that I've included it is because I wanted people to be aware of where Wright was before he travelled first to Italy and then to Bath. He has really reached the wonderful achievement of this whole series of astonishing pictures, um, finishing up with this one in 1771. And this is again about scientific discovery, about discovering new things, about light out of darkness. But if any of you have read Richard Dormant's lovely review in the Telegraph, there was one thing I disagreed about where he, he says this is turning traditional religious iconography on its head. I think that's true, but we forget that in the title it says the philosopher prays for the successful conclusion of his experiment. In other words, he's not relying entirely on his own resources. So again, this is the kind of thing that you would have seen going on in Bath in the late 1770s. We have accounts of the Bath Philosophical Society doing very similar experiments to this in their darkened room, observing optical effects. This picture was probably in Bath, um, almost certainly in Bath, although it was painted earlier. It wasn't sold at the Society of Artists exhibition. Wright took it with him to Italy, wasn't sold in Italy, so he brought it back, presumably to Bath, and exhibited it here. And he must surely have exhibited the mezzotint version, which was done by William Pether, who was his best man. So I've mentioned about the Lunar Society, about Erasmus Darwin, and here he is. Um, he's a nice man, isn't he? A uh, nice doctor. I think he, was, he had a good bedside manner, but he was so much more than just a country physician. Um, he was a botanist, he was an empiricist, he did lots of experiments to try and find out how people's bodies worked. He did experiments to see how the whole natural world worked. He paid other people to do experiments for him. He corresponded with scientists in Bath. He often came to Bath to take the waters. And he was also a poet. So he's a very Renaissance sort of man. But what excites me most about this picture is the label on the back. This isn't in the exhibition. It's just been bought by Birmingham Museum, so they weren't able to lend it to us. But before it was sold, I managed to see it in the gallery that was selling it. That's the label on the back. Erasmus Darwin, MD, aged 40. A copy of the original, both done by Mr. Wright of Bath, formerly of Derby, 1770. Now, the date 1770 is of the original version. This is a later copy, which was done in 1776. Not in Bath, but during the summer holiday when Wright went home from Bath um, to take up his old friendships and to visit his doctor. And the reason he visited his doctor was that he was chronically ill. The other person that he visited that summer holiday was Erasmus's sister-in-law, Jane. Um, 
and I've put this portrait at the front of the exhibition because it says so much about where he was as an artist in 1766. As I said, he'd just been to Italy, and this shows very strong influence of what he saw in Italy. He did a lot of drawings of antique sculpture. This is from a sketchbook in the British Museum. And you can also see the influence of the old masters, of Raphael, and particularly his Madonna della Sedia. So you can see the colours, very, very similar. And that chair, almost the same chair. When you go upstairs, you'll have all the time, you've got three months to enjoy this. Um, and you'll notice things like how the, the red reflects in the gilt chair there. This is a, a lovely picture. I love how he's transformed this rather plain provincial lady into a beautiful Madonna and child. This is a letter from Erasmus Darwin to we're not quite sure who, but it's a very key document in this story because he says, I have taken the liberty to give this letter of introduction to my friend Mr. Wright of Derby, who, since his return from Italy, is arrived in Bath, is what he says, he's come, he's come to Bath, and designs to stay there for some time, designs to settle there for some time um, on account of his health. He says uh, his health has been somewhat impaired in the next line. His, his health has been somewhat impaired by his great application to painting. He's been working too hard, worked too hard in Italy. So that's one reason why he came. The other reason, according to family tradition, um, goes like this. This is his daughter, Hannah, writing in the middle of the 19th century. Sorry, his, his niece, Hannah, writing in the middle of the 19th century. She says, Gainsborough having left Bath in 1774, it was thought there was a good opening for a portrait painter. Therefore, Mr. Wright and his wife and his youngest sister, Anne, and the little pop, little pop, popic was their daughter, left his brothers and went to Bath. His intention, therefore, was to replace Gainsborough as a portrait painter. This is the sort of portrait that he was painting before he left for Italy. 1771 again, Mr and Mrs Coltman. Do you remember them in the corner of the air pump experiment? Here they are going out for a ride. And um, I won't spend too long showing you the slide of this because we've got the real thing upstairs. There is so much beautiful detail in here, so much wonderfully observed English life going on with the horses and the, the dog, that rather frightened looking dog confronting the horse, the trees. Um, you can almost smell the weather going on. Colt is an interesting character because he may have helped Wright to finance his trip around Italy. Um, they certainly had a financial relationship. Coltman was actually Wright's tenant. He rented a townhouse from Joseph Wright. So I hope that gives you a sense of Wright's status. Um, he was a landlord. He wasn't a starving artist in a garret. He was a person with a certain amount of personal fortune. So we come to the section of the exhibition on portraiture. He wants to paint portraits for all those rich, fashionable, discerning people in Bath. And the first one that you see in the gallery is this one. This person is neither rich, nor fashionable, nor discerning. This is his little girl, and she's come to this new town. She's about 18 months old. She's come with her young mother and her aunt Nancy and her father. And they've settled in a house in Brock Street. Let me just show you how much of an influence she was on her father. These are some of the sketches that he did in Rome of her crawling. 
Um, she was born in Rome, hence her name Romana. And quite soon after she was born, he wrote home and said, I watch with infinite pleasure its infant state and slow advances to sensibility. And then he says, I pray it will make me happy. Sort of suggesting he's never been happy and hopes that having a baby might help. Um, and you can see she doesn't look terribly happy as well. Um, she looks almost as worried as he does. And I love the way that he understands children. He's able to get inside their heads and understand what's going on there. Look at the dog. He's going to appear again later on in the story. So he arrives in November 1775 and he makes a little note at the bottom of his Italian journal saying, entered upon Mr. Sproul's house, 9th of November 1775. My horse, note that he has a horse, so again, not, not a starving artist in a garret. My horse went towards livery stable, 29th of December 1775. William Ward, the stable man, built what's now called the Checkers. And um, some of you might know that behind the Checkers, there's a beautiful old stable yard, which was completely untouched until last year. It's now been redeveloped into eye-wateringly expensive flats. Um, but that, that livery stable is still there. Mr. Spruill's house, very, very close by, I'll show you on the map. Um, so that's the circus, that's the new assembly rooms. Andrew Spruill was part of the consortium that built those rooms at the beginning of the 1770s. There is Brock Street present. Um, this map is, is more or less contemporary with 1776. Margaret's buildings about there, and, and this house was here. So there's um, what's uh, going to become River Street. So the checkers would be kind of there. That's the stable lane where all the stables are. So he's got this house that looks onto stable lane in a fantastic location because he's right between the circus and the Royal Crescent. And to get to the Crescent in those days before the park had been developed and the gravel walk, you had to go down Brock Street. So everybody is passing his front door. This is what the house looks like today. It's number 30 in case you want to pass by. This is number 30. It's got this beautiful Venetian window in the drawing room overlooking Stable Lane. Obviously, St. Stephen's wasn't there at the time that was built later on. Um, so it's quite a busy kind of environment with lots of things going on, lots of workshops and stables and things. Um, obviously, none of this stuff. But... It's really interesting to have this lovely big window to capture the north light. And you can use the shutters to vary the amount of light that comes in. This house has still got all these beautiful details from when Sproul first developed it. It's a really lovely house. And what I, I like, we really enjoyed looking at this plasterwork. And also, these, these details here just seem made for hanging pictures in, don't they? You've got your own picture frames there that you can hang pictures in. He certainly welcomed people into the house. You had to, probably to pay a shilling. He took a lot of money on the door from people who paid to come in and see these spectacular paintings. But he has problems getting portrait commissions. So on the 15th of January, 1776, He'd only been here a couple of months, but he's already complaining. He says, you'll scarce believe I have not had one portrait bespoke. He does get a commission later that month from this lady. This is the formidable Duchess of Cumberland. She was a commoner, a widow, who married the king's brother, much to the king's annoyance. Um, and Gainsborough did many portraits of her. You can see how beautiful she was, but also that she was quite formidable. And although she came to see Wright, she was from Derbyshire as well, 
they had a mutual friend in Lady Ferrers. But the commission eventually came to nothing, and Wright complains to his brother. He says, the great people are so fantastical and whimmy, they create a world of trouble. By April, he says, I have only painted four heads, yet the prejudice still runs high against me. He now thinks there's a plot against him. Um, I'm now painting a half-length of Dr. Wilson and his adopted daughter, Miss McCauley. There they are. This is for reputation only, but you must not say so. In other words, they're not paying him for it. Dr. Wilson is an interesting character and nowadays is, is remembered in a rather unfortunate light because of what happened the following year, long after this picture was, was painted. But here he is looking very grandfatherly. He was a retired clergyman. Um, he, his parish was in the city of London. And here he is with this little girl that he adopted. He had no children of his own. Um, his own parents had died when he was very young, and this little girl lost her father when she was still a baby. And between them is this book, Macaulay's History. Her mother is Catherine Macaulay, who was a very famous, very celebrated, but also a very controversial historian, not just because she was a woman, but also because of her very radical, republican, libertarian ideas. She was so famous that she was one of the few living people to have a Derby porcelain figure made. One of the reasons I've included this is to make the point that Derby was already becoming an important manufacturing city. They were making not just useful things like textiles, um, but also beautiful things like porcelain figures that we've got so many of in the collection. But here she is on her pedestal with her books, with um, a, in, an inscription here in praise of liberty. And it's probably based on this portrait, which was made here in Bath by Robert Edge Pine. Pine was an old friend of Wright's from the Society of Artists. And uh, he had a really nice studio here in Bath. It was just by... You know where the, not where the, the main entrance to the new spa is, but they have a sort of gift shop off to one side. It's, it's more or less in that block there by St. John's Hospital. So again, a really good location. But Pine was not happy in Bath. He eventually ran away because he was so radical, so Republican, that he preferred to live in the United States. So off he went. And Mrs. Macaulay actually made a tour of America not long afterwards. What does it say? It says, government, a power delegated for the happiness of mankind, conducted by wisdom, justice, and mercy. Which, to those who are familiar with the American Declaration of Independence, it might, might sound like quite familiar sort of words remembering that this is the year 1776 when all that happened in America. And if you look at copies of the Bath Chronicle, most of the first page is taken up with very, very closely typed accounts of skirmishes and battles and treaties and things going on in the colonies overseas. So this is where they lived, Alfred House called Alfred House, because there's King Alfred. It's a house where historians live. Dr. Wilson had a very fine library. He was of a similar political persuasion to Mrs. Macaulay, and he invited her to come and live with him, and he adopted her little girl. But people did not approve of some of the behaviour that went on there, particularly Mrs. Macaulay's birthday party in 1777, which was described as folly worshipping the shrine of vanity. Because what they did is they took her, they sat her on a seat in an elevated position, they gave her a little crown, and they read odes in her honour, which praised her as modern Minerva and things like that. Um, and some of the odes in the account of the party were published in the London <coughs> papers. All of the odes were, were published as a little book in aid of charity, 
Um, but the people in London thought this was absolutely ridiculous, very embarrassing, and they made lots of cartoons. And I think this cartoon, it's only a tiny thing like this. We borrowed it from the Victoria Gallery over the road. But this cartoon shows them, well, she's writing, he is admiring her, and there's King Alfred. There's the old library with all the books. And um, this may be based on Wright's portrait. You've certainly got a very similar table, and he's looking very much as he does in Wright's portrait. A couple more cartoons. There is Catherine Macaulay as Queen of Bath. There is Dr. Wilson as Beau Nash, who organised this very silly party for her. The cartoon that we have is... Um, this is a different um, literary lady. She kept a sort of salon of her own. Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller thought of herself as a great connoisseur. And she had these nice parties where she would bring people together, um, encourage them to write poetry. And what you would do is you would go along on a Thursday morning. They happened at sort of 11s time, so you'd have nice breakfast things like um, buns and chocolate and ice cream. And um, you, would, you would be set a task before you came. You had to write a poem either on a particular subject or in a, in a particular form. And you would bring your poem to the party. You would place it in the urn, and then they would be drawn one by one from the urn. They would be read out, and whichever poem was considered the best would win the crown of myrtle. And here's, this is just reference to all the different sorts of poems that were going on. In the, in the party, and there's the myrtle crown which you could win. If you would like to win your own myrtle crown, we have this picture in the Sackler Gallery upstairs. You're invited to write poems of your own, serious or not, and uh, then you can try on the myrtle crown for yourself. It's a really, they've done it really beautifully. Do go and have a look, it's such fun. This is her house, Bath Eastern Villa. Uh, which is in Balebrook Lane now. Um, these parties, both the ones at Mrs. Macaulay's house and the ones at Mrs. Miller's house, were really important ways of getting to know people. And the reason that I've dwelt on Mrs. Miller is because, you remember that letter I showed you from Erasmus Darwin? It was probably addressed to her, saying, Mr. Wright has come to Bath, he is unknowing or unknown, he doesn't know anybody here, Please introduce him to people. But we don't know whether he actually bothered going to any of these parties. Um, he certainly knew a lot of people at them. They're old, old friends from Derbyshire. And he certainly had a copy of the odes which were written for Mrs. Macaulay's birthday. But his copy of the odes has never been opened. The pages are still uncut. So he probably didn't think very much of it. Now he mentions... Um, four heads. When he, he writes to his brother on the 15th of April, he said, um, I have only painted four heads. And no one's been quite able to work out which four heads they were. Some of them may have been lost. But this is probably one of them. This is Agnes Witts, who was newly married. She came to Bath, probably for her health. And as you can she, see, she's also a literary lady. <coughs> She was um, a diarist, kept a journal of all her comings and goings between Bath and Cheltenham and Stroud, where her husband was busy developing the woolen industry. Um, and this is sometimes quoted as an example of why Wright failed as a portrait painter. It has many merits. It's got beautiful colouring. It's got these wonderful effects of the, the pearls and the muslin with the silver running through it. Um, but he's failed to pick up very much character in this sitter. And I think the reason for that was to do with time. This lady was a stranger, he didn't know her, he didn't have time to get to know her. And people, of course, were transient. They came to Bath for a short time and then they moved on. So it was difficult for a meticulous painter like him to really give his clients what they needed. He did succeed here though. This is John Milnes. He writes in May 
I have in hand a small full length of Mr. Mills. He already knew this man. He wasn't somebody who just walked in casually off the street. He was from Wakefield. He's just inherited a um, big industrial business and lots of money. And he wants to come to Bath and spend his money on beautiful clothes and accessories and lovely pictures for his picture gallery. Wright has already, in 1772, painted a picture of Mills's older brother, Captain Robert Shaw Mills. So these were sort of made as companions in a, a similar sort of composition with these great forked trees, lots of um, very textured leaves. And in John's case, the ship in the background is a reference to his mercantile activities. The important thing about John Mills is that he becomes Wright's biggest fan. He spends, over the course of the next 15 years, he spends about a thousand pounds on paintings just from Wright. And he buys some of his biggest and most important, most ambitious works, including the two which were most successful in Bath. Oh, I just want to show you some details. You're much better off looking at the actual picture, but this is just an example of the sort of wonderfully mad textures that he introduces to his pictures. These branches are just done by scraping with the wooden end of his brush. So, the pictures that really succeed in Bath and beyond are the pictures inspired by his travels in Italy. In Italy, he was there for about 18 months, moving around. He found a flat for his wife in Rome where she could have her baby and bring her up. He was friendly with many important British artists and patrons. So in Italy, he makes three discoveries. One, the old masters. He's very hard working, as we've heard. He spends a lot of time copying visiting galleries, visiting churches, seeing those very famous artists that he's heard all about. He discovers what he calls the amazing and stupendous remains of antiquity, so sculpture and architecture. And here he's getting to know one of the most wonderful pieces of architecture in Rome, the Colosseum. And again, this is a picture which rewards the time that you spend looking at it seeing how he develops his technique, seeing how he enjoys the challenge of a building which is not made up of straight lines, but which is made up of curves, and he's created these wonderful spirals. The third thing that inspires him is the natural landscape. He is astonished by the, the beauty of it. He says the natural scenes are so beautiful and uncommon with an atmosphere so pure and clear that objects 20 miles distant seem not half the way. So he experiments with new techniques to express these new ideas. Um, contrast between light and dark, as you can see here, between vegetable and mineral, straight and curved, all these textures, and above all, rocks. He really gets interested in rocks while he's in Italy, and of course fire. He carries on with the fire theme. So here he is about May 1774, very intrigued by a fire, probably a bonfire that's been lit in a piazza somewhere below his flat. And um, the effect of the fire on the buildings at night time. He then sees, um, at, probably at Easter, um, he sees the wonderful firework display which is put on every year and has been, um, it's been going probably since the 15th century and certainly since the time of Michelangelo, this wonderful firework display which they still do and whose highlight is the so-called girandola and, and that's, um, they have all these rockets on the roof of the Castel Sant'Angelo. They've actually had to modify this in modern times because they discovered that the castle was being shaken to bits by all these things exploding on the roof. But there is that moment when it all goes off. And what he's beginning to do here 
is experiment with his composition. He's moved the buildings around, rather as somebody like Hanini would do, taking all the famous buildings and sticking them together in one corner. Whereas here, he's being very accurate topographically. So here's a worked up, finished version of the Girandola. This one is in Soho House. It's actually one of my favorites, but I didn't choose it for the exhibition in the end. You can see, this always amazes me. How did they get all those torches onto the roof of St. Peter's? If anybody can tell me, please do let me know. Um, and there is a preliminary study for that, um, where he's being very, very accurate, standing on the banks of the Tiger, working out exactly what sits where. Um, and here are some people standing on the bank, as they do today, waiting to go, ooh, and ah. And apparently the best view is for a boat. This is a letter that he probably sent to somebody like Thomas Coltman in, um, back home in Derby. Now, this is the version of the Girandola which we have here. It's from the Walker Art Gallery in Birmingham. And he writes about this going back now to January the 15th. You remember that was the day when he was saying, nobody's come to me for any portraits. But great numbers visit my painting room daily. All admire my pictures exceedingly and say they never expected to see such a painter in Bath. As to the picture of Vesuvius, the town rings with commendations of it. I have just now finished a companion to it, the exhibition of a great firework from the castle of Sant'Angelo in Rome. The one is the greatest effect of nature. There we are, greatest effect of nature. And the other, the greatest effect of art that I suppose can be. So it's the comparison which many people doing the Grand Tour made. So Mrs. Miller, for instance, when she wrote about seeing Vesuvius, she said it's just like a firework display. And William Hamilton speaks of Vesuvius as being like a great girandole of sparks. So he's not the first one to, to make that similarity, but he's the one who has the idea of turning them into paintings. And they make a huge impression. After showing these in Bath, he then sends them to London to the Society of Artists exhibition. So in April, he says, I've sent my two pictures to the exhibition where I hope they will meet with as much approbation as they have here and better success with regard to the sale of them. He initially uh, was quite slow to sell these, but eventually they were bought by John Milnes, and that's the beginning of Milnes's great spending spree that lasts for 15 years. Um, you'll notice that these aren't quite in the same shape. They're not a pair, and I don't want you to be, be deceived into thinking these are the exact ones that he was talking about. He made at least eight different versions of the Durandola picture. He made about... 30 different views of Vesuvius and the Bay of Naples and we can't be sure exactly which were the first ones um, so these are as near as I've been able to get there is another wonderful Vesuvius picture from this period uh, well there are, there are two others one's ended up in America so that's out and the other one is in very poor condition there we are there, you're, you're better off looking at this in, in real life, so I won't say too much about it. We'll move on to this very strange picture. Um, John Milnes bought this one as well, and it's a little bit smaller than the others. It depicts a place where Wright never actually went. This is Mount Etna in Sicily, and the volcano part of it has been based very closely on Wright's studies of Vesuvius and the landscape around Vesuvius. The texture here is incredibly knobbly and he obviously really enjoyed visiting Vesuvius, seeing all the little pieces of pumice strewn around the surface and replicating them here. But the city of Catania here, this is very odd. Um, it's obviously based on a print He's even got the colours wrong, because of course in Italy they don't have slate roofs like they do in Derbyshire. The roofs are all made of terracotta. 
Now I'm going to come to the section in the centre of the gallery, and this takes forward the themes of volcanoes and geometry, because um, he writes to his brother um, about um, being on Vesuvius, and he makes reference to this gentleman here, John Whitehurst. He says, when you see Whitehurst, who was a close neighbour of theirs, tell him I wished for his company when on Mount Vesuvius. His thoughts would have entered into the bowels of the mountain, while mine skimmed over the surface only. So this is Whitehurst's sort of think bubble up here. Um, this is the, he's making a drawing of what he eventually published. This is a cross-section of the River Derwent at Matlock, very near to Derby. Whitehurst was an amateur geologist, no such thing as a professional geologist quite yet. Uh, one of the first professional geologists was William Smith, who lived just down the road, a generation on. But Whitehurst really was a clock and scientific instrument maker. But he was really intrigued to discover how these limestone formations came about and how all these exciting rock formations in his own home county were all to do with the same thing that makes volcanoes happen, what he calls subterraneous fires. And one of the most fascinating things about this drawing is the way that Wright really does paint the surface. So what I've done here, I've, I've taken his diagram and I've flipped it round. So there you have the river. This is a, a, a like... Um, a fault in the limestone and it slips so he studied the strata so you could see how the layers originally fitted together before this fault happened the river has flowed through since the ice age and here it's all rubbly so you can see the effect of the rubble on the water here it creates these rapids and then there is Matlock High Tor up there which is left high and dry above the river while the opposite bank of the river slopes gently away there's the road there, that little flat bit, um, and two tiny, tiny little figures walking along the road. So what Wright does when he returns from Italy to Derby is that he sees his native landscape with fresh eyes and begins painting it and making quite a lot of money out of it. He would often pair views of Derbyshire with views of Italy. Um, really to make the point that his own county was just as beautiful. It was the most picturesque and most fashionable county in England. So I've sort of made up a pairing of two of these. This is a very late, probably late 1780s landscape. And you see here how he's taken the idea of a view in Italy. This is another place that he never went to. On the label at the bottom of the picture, it says Castel Gandolfo. I've worked out that actually it's not Castel Gandolfo at all. It's a bit misleading, but it's definitely not Castel Gandolfo because if it was, then the Pope's Palace would have crashed into this gorge here. Um, it's actually based on this drawing. But up here it says Monte Nuovo. That's uh, indicating number one. There's Monte Nuovo, which is this amazing mountain which just suddenly appeared one day in 1538 out of the Bay of Naples. So it's a volcano. This mountain here, that's another volcano. So I've been able to work out more or less where this is on the Bay of Naples. And these ancient ruins here were thought in Wright's time to be remnants of Cicero's villa, one of many of Cicero's villas. So there are many associations with this picture. It's about volcanoes, but it's also about transients, the passing of the ancient Roman civilization, and the way that things can suddenly be destroyed by the power of nature. The reason I've included the drawing is to explain how he worked, that many, many years after visiting Italy, he was still working on new views of new places that he'd never been to, and he would have friends in Italy send him studies of real places so that he could make views of them.
The final section of the exhibition is about Wright as a storyteller. This is a strange picture based on Aesop's fables, The Old Man and Death. And I think this was made in Bath. It's in rather poor condition. It's quite damaged. So you'll notice that the top of this arrow has disappeared somewhere over here. Um, it's based on an original which is much larger and very, very beautiful. It's got this lovely springtime landscape and in the corner this horrible thing where this old man is being threatened by death with his arrow. Here you can see, can you see the, the, the whole arrow there? Um, so this, uh, the original version, this one, which is in Boston now, this was exhibited at the Society of Artists in 1774 when Wright was in Italy. It didn't sell, so when he came back from Italy, he presumably had it sent to Bath so that he could exhibit it in Bath. And I think what must have happened is that somebody saw the big version, they liked it, it was too big for them, and so they ordered a version of just the scary bit from the corner. Wright has already started, while he's in Italy, experimenting with narratives and particularly with single figures. This is a, a very unusual thing. He doesn't normally do, at this point, um, figures interacting. It's normally one figure alone in a lonely situation, in perhaps a rather a hopeless situation, so that people will look at the picture and go, oh, so that's the kind of reaction he's trying to get. And the reason he does that is because he wants people not just to admire a picture for its beauty, but to be touched, um, to feel their heart being touched and to realise the presence of a tender heart beating inside themselves. And in those days, there wasn't a great deal of tenderness going on. I think we've become quite soppy as a society. Um, here's the first of his soppy pictures. Um, based on an idea from The Sentimental Journey by Lawrence Stern. He probably knew Stern. Stern used to hang around with friends of his from the Society of Artists. And here is a poor captive in prison. Um, this is in Vancouver, so again, this couldn't come to the exhibition, but this is a really beautiful study. Um, he's obviously been perhaps attending life classes in Rome, was certainly looking at ancient sculpture. Um, and you're supposed to look at this picture of the poor captive who's stuck in prison and go, oh, this is another captive that he did maybe in Bath later on, not nearly as successful. And I think the problem here was his original uh, model, who is not in a, in a pitiful situation at all. He's in the most wonderful situation imaginable. He is about to be brought to life. And here's someone who's kind of almost at the opposite end of the spectrum, somebody who's wondering whether his life is worth living. So not very successful. Um, we have exhibited this in Pickpocketing the Rich, but I thought I'd give it a miss this time because it's not the most inspiring picture, but I hope it gives you a sense of how he develops his ideas. Back to Dr. Darwin. And the reason I put him in is to remind you of that summer holiday which Wright took. The bath season was coming to an end, um, not much business going on, so he went back home. He took his family home. His wife was about to have another baby. It was much safer for her to do that at home than in Bath, which was plagued with all these expensive doctors. And while he's there, he visits his own doctor. He goes to see Erasmus because he's not feeling very well, he's not very happy. And he also sees a doctor called Dr. Berridge. And it's while he's with Dr. Berridge that he makes this very important encounter with William Haley and his wife, Eliza. And the reason Haley is so important is that he becomes his new best friend. Do you remember 
Burdett, Peter Perez Burdett, who I mentioned at the beginning. Burdett did a runner. He escaped with everybody's money, including rights, to Germany and was never seen again. And Wright lost the man who inspired so many of his ideas. And Haley will become that new best friend. So I think one of the problems in Bath is that he doesn't have a best friend. He doesn't have a sort of right-hand man giving him ideas, giving his, him encouragement. And this is a very important role that Haley takes on. He was an amateur poet. He was a very, very successful poet in his own lifetime. He wrote um, a long poem called The Triumphs of Temper, which was especially popular with young ladies, but hasn't been published since about 1830 because it is so dire. <laughs> but what he is important for nowadays is that he was a mentor, not just to write, but also to George Romney, to William Blake, and to the poet William Cooper. So he is a very important sort of eminence grise in the cultural life of late 18th century Britain. So he encourages Wright to choose subjects from modern literature. Um, this is another subject from Stern. This is another woeful, forlorn character, Maria, who has been abandoned, forsaken by her sweetheart. Her father has died, her goat has died, and she's just left with her little doggy, Silvio. Do you recognize him? I think that's the family pup. Um, and here she is, sitting all alone, um, playing her flute and behaving in a rather peculiar but strangely beguiling way, which Stern finds irresistible and which we're also supposed to find irresistible. Um, this is interesting because of the influences that are going into it. So there's a lot, as you can see, there's a lot of Roman sculpture in here. This is a, a Roman mourning relief, effectively based quite closely on things like this. This is a very famous one um, in the Capitoline Museums. I don't have a photo of the original Roman sculpture, but this is another grand tourist. The architect William Chambers made this drawing of it um, around about the same time. This is, it's called the Weeping Dacia. So it's, an, it's a, a subjugated people. It's an allegory of, of uh, the Dacian people who were sort of modern-day Romania, who held out against the Romans and eventually were overcome by them. So again, it's this sense of being defeated, giving up on life. That's one influence. The other important influence, although in a less direct way, is this very, very famous image, Juris Melancholia of 1514. He does a lot of drawing in Rome, as I said. This is a drawing that he made from a live model and which is upstairs, showing a similar, slightly different pose. Um, and this led him to do a second version of Maria later on, after Bath, in 1781. Um, different dog, slightly different pose, and you can see her flute this time. Now, Maria is actually made as an exhibition piece as a companion to this picture, Edwin. Edwin is done just after he returns to Derby from Bath, and he corresponds a lot with the author of the book on which the character is based, James Beattie. Um, it's from a book called The Minstrel. And this boy, Edwin, he sort of wanders around the countryside. He is inspired to become a poet and a musician. Here is his flute. Wright himself also played the flute. If he was feeling a bit down, he would wander off into the woods and tootle on his flute and cheer himself up. So Edwin becomes a sort of alter ego. And the two pictures, Edwin and Maria, become very famous as a pair. They weren't both exhibited at the same time, but they're sold very successfully as prints, and the prints often go together as a pair. And he's taken this idea, turned it into these two portraits, which are in the exhibition. Very strange portraits, because this lady, 
has commissioned them. Her name is Helen Morwood, and she commissioned this portrait of herself in a sort of Maria-like pose, minus the dog. And this is her friend Henry Case, who's in a sort of cross between um, Edwin and Hamlet kind of pose. Um, he's a clergyman from Warwickshire. He is not Mrs. Morwood's husband. She's married to Mr. Morwood. And she remains married to Mr. Morwood for about 10 years until he dies. And then she marries Mr. Case. So quite what's going on with this, these portraits. Did she have them in her house? Were they in his house? We don't know. That's a mystery that's waiting to be solved. Last picture. The Indian Widow. You can see again, it's the same basic figure that's been dressed up or undressed in a different way. And this is a subject taken from, um, from a non-fiction book, suggested by Haley. It's a book about the customs of the American Indians, um, published in 1775. And this picture he made in 1785, quite some time after Bath, as a centerpiece of a one-man show which Haley persuaded him to do at Covent Garden. Um, I must point out the most intriguing detail because it's not on the label. You see the tomahawk? That was made in Sheffield. They were made in Sheffield and exported to Canada. Okay, so what happens next? He's in Derby for 18 months. Um, sorry, he's in Bath for 18 months. Goes back to Derby, slightly with his tail between his legs. He likes Derby, it's his home, it's where his family are. He's a big fish in a small pond. He wants his children to grow up there. It's an exciting city. In 1796, Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote, Derby is full of curiosities. The cotton, the silk mills, Wright the painter, and Dr. Darwin, the everything. Um, and he rarely leaves Derby. He stays there. Um, he does a little tour of the Lake District later in life. He settles down in his own family home, um, has more children, and earns lots of money from painting the kind of lovely landscapes I've just shown you. But he carries on doing portraits as well. He's got a very strong client base locally, he always has, but his reputation in London is never that strong. And that's one reason why he did that big one-man show in 1785, to get, um, a, a, to renew his, his public image in London. Okay, um, I just want to clarify quickly which pictures really were made in Bath because I don't want people thinking that everything in the exhibition was made in Bath. So just to run through them quickly, these were definitely made in Bath. A version of this, possibly lost, Dr. Wilson, Mrs. Witts, Mr. Milnes, and the picture of his daughter, um, probably done in Bath. These are now the probables. So probably his daughter, um, the Vesuvius, probably brought over from Italy. Um, Etna, possibly already done in Italy. A captive, um, a version of the old man and death. And this is not in the exhibition. I'm very sorry because it really is amazing. Um, this is in the MFA of Boston, and um, he did some wonderful pictures of grottos, and there just wasn't room for them in the exhibition. And then I mentioned the summer holidays when he did the extra portraits. Um, some of the other pictures in the exhibition he probably exhibited in Bath. So, a few things you need to know. The little porcelain figure of Miss, Mrs. Macaulay has an alarm in the case. So if you hear quite a quiet little alarm go off close by you, you don't need to do anything because it resets itself automatically. All it means is that somebody has bumped into that case. Um, I mentioned the activities in the Sattler. Have a look at them today because they are very nice. Um, there is the book. 
There are postcards on their way. They're not quite ready yet, but we should have them in the next few days. Um, we have the study day on the 24th of February, and the exhibition goes on to Derby Museum from the 24th of May to the 31st of August. The last thing I must mention, of course, is our new acquisition, Mrs. Balgai, who is on the first floor landing and has been given to us by Her Majesty's government. So, although we say it's been given to the museum by David Posner, it has actually come from the government, um, having been given to the government by David Posner. So it's a sort of a, a transfer thing. Uh, it's quite a clever scheme. And it's the first, um, it's, it's the third painting that's ever or that the third thing that's ever been given to a museum through this new scheme, which I think is, is really going to sort of liven up people's charitable giving to museums. So there we are. It's high time I shut up and let you actually go and have a look. So Spencer's come to rescue you. And if you follow him, he'll open the magic door. Six in Bath. Nobody. I think the market had gone dead in some Because way. of the war. Oh, yeah. it, yes. Um, yeah. Bath had stopped growing. Yes. It wasn't. At the beginning of the 18th century, it was really exclusive. Mm. And so, you know, it's really exciting. And people hear about it and they all want to come. And then once everybody's been, yes. they go and look for something else. And so yeah. it was already beginning to wane a little mm. bit. As early as 1776, yeah. and the people who were coming were the sort of you know next echelon down, yes. who yeah. were oil paintings type yeah. people. So, so we yeah, had, we had nobody success, was successful. successful ventures like the Sydney Gardens as late later. as 1790. Yeah, yeah, later, but that was a very you know that was much more sort of lower middle class. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, sure. You're going. I'm going I just wanted to say thank you. That was wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Oh, gosh. And what a logical work. So that was you were working on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Sold four copies of the book this morning and the ex oh, exhibition ooh. hasn't even opened. Great. Excellent. And I think Maria's got great hopes of this evening when the patrons come. All signed. <laughs> some, yeah. yeah some, some, yeah. I can do some more if it's worth it. I don't know. It feels like I'm defacing it. It's so attractive. I think it's really touch wood going well. Yeah. But thanks for this. Um, I just want to ask, is it your feeling then that he's kind of jumping on the bandwagon a bit to try and get the portrait money and it doesn't really work in that way? Because then people want to do the kind of sculptural... They didn't, they didn't know him. They didn't know him as a portrait painter. Um, and those who were having their portraits painted, which wasn't many, um, go elsewhere. Um, well, he'd, he'd gone by then, so they would go elsewhere. Um, and there were, there were just too many people to choose from. The market was a bit saturated because he wasn't the only person who had... Yeah. Other people had had the idea before him. It's not that too late. It's sitting there just on Brock Street and everything. You planned it so well. <laughs> to kind of yes, capture all those but there were several flaws in his plan, and one was that he wasn't very well. Yeah. And um, it's odd that he came. Why did he come here if he was ill and yet try and set up a business? Yeah. So. Okay, thanks so much.